warm welcome to you all. My name's Emma. I'm the founder and managing director of Chief Disruptor, formerly known as Nimbus 90. For those of you who are joining us for the first time, we're the community for disruptive business and technology leaders. And as a community, we believe that disruption is a catalyst for business transformation. And at Chief Disruptor, our mission is to help members make sense of disruptive trends and technologies through our research and follow-up activities. In 2023, um, we've been looking particularly at disruptive trends for the following year. And as a result of that, our survey has already launched in 2022 to see what will be occurring in 2023. The survey aims to explore the disruptive trends and technologies driving business and technology priorities in the following year. And also for the first time, the impact of wider external market changes and challenges. So today, we're talking about what's arguably the greatest and certainly the most hyperfueled disruptive trend since the launch of the internet itself, the metaverse. We've been exploring the metaverse the last year, and this has led us to survey our members and produce our report, Making Sense of the Metaverse. The research was led by Caroline Boyd, who's our Head of Research and Strategic Development, and also by Gabriel O'Brien, our researcher for our Chief Disruptor community. And Gabriel is joining us here today. He's going to share with you the results of our survey and we'll invite our distinguished panelists to comment and discuss on the wider implications of the findings. So to run you through the aims of this afternoon's session, we enable, will enable you to understand what the metaverse is and what it means to business and technology leaders. We'll also share the results of our first member survey on the metaverse and discuss the important implications of findings for the wider community and also explore and evaluate three the use cases for the metaverse and those considering their first steps into the metaverse. So a lot to cover today from the use cases to how it can affect your business. We'd like to keep to the hour and we'd like to obviously make sure it's as interactive as possible. So we'll be sharing with you a live poll, which we'd love you to take part in, and we'll be allowing some time for Q&A at the end. So please feel free to use the chat and Q&A function throughout the session if you have a question you'd like to ask any of the panelists. So I'm now gonna hand over to Gabriel, who contributed towards research and will be hosting today. Many thanks indeed. Thank you, Emma, and uh, good afternoon and welcome to everyone who's joined us. Um, and a special thank you um, to those of you who took part in our Making Sense of the Metaverse survey. Um, and today we hope to do just that. Um, but first, it's my pleasure to introduce you to our panelists for today. Firstly, we are joined by Misha Dola, Chief Architect at Ericsson, who is joining us from Silicon Valley. Um, Misha works on cutting edge topics of, six, of 6G, Metaverse, XR, Quantum and Blockchain. He also serves on the Technical Advisory Committee of the FCC and the Spectrum Advisory Board of Ofcom. Secondly, we are joined by Santi, the co-founder and creative technology director at Vital. Santi is passionate about exploring emergency, emerging technologies and bringing new creative ideas that help organizations to deliver greater business value. He has 15 years of experience in digital design, video, film production, CGI, as well as others. Santi has delivered best-in-class experiences and digital solutions to some of the world's biggest blue chip companies. It's a real pleasure to have them both. Um, I, I want to, as a way of introduction and welcome you, if you could tell us a bit about um, how you became interested in the metaverse. Um, Misha, can I start with you? Well, good morning from Silicon Valley. Yeah, so we actually, we are sitting right in the, in the midst of the design hub here. Um, very close to Meta, who kind of threw out the terminology, doesn't want to own it, yet has a, a big stake in that. Um, you know, the Metaverse evolves a lot around devices. A lot of that is being designed here, applications and networks. I'm working for a networking company. So that's how our, our interest really started to, to kind of spike in that area. And we're trying to make sense out of that and really trying to make sure that, uh, you know, that goes from a hype into reality. I would probably say that uh, the reason how I started to be interested in metaverse is coming back to 2015, I think, and that's the that's the Oculus uh, Oculus history, and our company and I worked in uh, different agencies before. We started to look at how can we build experiences for our clients in virtual reality in the first place, but then a lot of that, a lot of those ideas materialize in a way that how can we connect 
different things together? How can we put it online? How can it not be just a standalone application? And, and, and how we can bring different tools and combine them together? And I think Metaverse is actually that environment where you can combine different platforms and different tools. So that's, you know, I'm fascinated by it. Uh, it's very interesting seeing the early days. And uh, yeah, it's exciting. Great. Thanks so much, Santi. Um, I'm, I'm sure we're in, we're in for a hell of a hell of a discussion. So I'll just start our webinar um, with a bit of background information on the survey um, first, if I may. Um, the survey was completed by 110 senior decision makers across a wide range of job titles, remits and sectors. And you can see the breakdown um, in the following two slides. So we've got the demographic of respondents here by industry. And then if we move on to the, the final, the next slide, um, we have the demographic of respondents. So the largest group of respondents were from digital and strategy remits, followed by uh, innovation. Uh, and the three most popular sectors who responded to the survey were technology, financial services, and other professional services. Um, and to sort of lay out our research aim, it was to explore um, with our members their readiness for the metaverse and their perceptions of how disruptive the metaverse is likely to be um, to businesses in the coming years. And um, we think it provides a fascinating snapshot of the, of the real um, business leaders um, perspective on the metaverse, as opposed to perhaps um, what Meta or, or other large, large company might, might say. And we, we hope that in this session this afternoon, we will get you all thinking about how your organization might need to adapt or evolve for the metaverse through highlighting a few of the significant findings from the report. We have our first finding. Um, so we asked, which of the following best describes your understanding of the metaverse? Um, and as you can see, the highest rated definition of the metaverse, but only at 26%, was a simulated environment facilitated by AR, VR, blockchain, and social media. Um, to give you more detail on this, we actually offered eight definitions to choose from, and yet many um, still chose other options and came up with their own definition. Um, these included the next iteration of the internet, Web3, um, also opportunity to engage more consumers and also potentially an advertising space. Um, so I think to, to pick up on that with, with you, Misha, perhaps, are, are you surprised to see that there's so many definitions of the metaverse chosen in our survey? Uh, not at all. A good question, Ash. I was thinking about this. How is it that it's so spread? But, you, you know, it, it reminds me really of the early days of the of the Internet, right? So and actually 2022 felt very much like 1998 here in the... Um, you know, we're, we're trying to consolidate on a, a, a kind of a terminology what it is, but, uh, you know, people start thinking it's going to be just the next internet and it's going to be more immersive and that's about it. So it's really not about specific ingredients. It's like, you know, the first line, it's like saying the internet is IPv4, uh, RG45 connectors and, 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 and service, right? So we don't think like this. I think we need to start re rethinking what the metaverse really is. And to us, it's just the next fully immersive internet. And uh, and that's it, right? And there's a lot of other implications we can discuss today, but from a definition point of view, I would just stick with that. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, and Santi, anything, uh, agree or disagree? I would actually agree with Misha. And I think, you know, we're seeing the early days of it, but I think metaverse in a very simple terms, you know, particularly what I think about it personally is a spatial internet. And, and we have so many different platforms, so many different tools, and it's a hardware and software combined together, that all of that is the future of the metaverse, when things are interconnected with each other, and we can easily experience different uh, experiences on different platforms without really getting, you know, we, we just we just have access in much easier ways. And in terms of your, in terms of the answers of what people think, I think most of them are actually correct, because it is a new economy. It is like founding in America, you know, uh, it's, a, it's a new world with its own rules, its own, you know, sort of existence. So, yeah, it's uh, I, I agree with Misha said. And I think I think uh, what we're going to see coming forward is a lot of, uh, you know, collaborations between companies that potentially have not been seen before because it's all for the benefit of that new world that we are creating. Mm, OK. And then so just sort of to wrap this up, do you think there's there's perhaps um, the hype around it is creating problems around defining it and that we perhaps need to look beyond defining it and think of it more as just a, as a, as an air, as a space or, um, you know, a, a concept? Um, I would say that the, the couple of things that I'm seeing myself 
is uh, a little bit irresponsible behavior for some of the big, bigger players. I think what I'm seeing is a little bit overpromising for things to happen sooner than they actually will. And I think also when you look at you know the past uh, history of let's say cryptocurrencies, when there was a lot of hype created that you should invest money, it's all going to be amazing, it's all going to be great. The technology was just about to mature, and you know we've seen what happened with it. So I think people, I mean, I understand people that are skeptical about it because there's a lot of conversations, and some of them are you know contradictory to uh, each other. And I think and I think we are getting there. It's gonna it's gonna definitely change. Uh, quite quickly, but you know, I, I personally feel that you know uh, I have a huge respect for the companies that are approaching it from a more realistic perspective, and, and I think and I think that's very important actually to to a lot of uh, companies that are thinking to invest, thinking to go for it. There's a little bit of a, you know, it's like we we're trying to run before we can walk uh, in some cases. So I think you know that's that's a little bit of a a little bit of an issue, but I'm sure it's going to be resolved quite soon. So it's fine. Yeah, yeah, just just uh, to uh, add, I mean, uh, Sandy makes a good point there. So the companies who try to make you know real sense out of that, in them, I'm actually not too worried that we have very different definitions of it all, uh, because right now we have to tackle some really hard engineering and computer science and social challenges and ethical challenges. So for everybody, it is kind of a different angle. You know, companies which do the HMDs, the head-mounted devices. They would say the metaverse is all about XR, AR, VR. To, to us as a networking company, it might be all about 5G. Others think about applications. So we're in these early days, right? So we need a lot of magic still to happen from truly from an engineering point of view. It's very hard. There are very, very, very hard problems we need to solve. Um, but eventually we will converge, right? So eventually we'll stop talking about, you know, the metaverse being X, Y, Z. It will just be that next, uh, you know, something that spatial, immersive internet as we stop talking about IP and, uh, you know, optical fibers and Ethernet cables uh, at some point when we build the Internet. You remember the early days for you guys, may still remember that it was all about, you know, mounting fiber and Ethernet cables in, in your dorms, probably. And if you ask some kids today out there, what's the Internet? Last thing they will tell you, it's all about, uh, you know, Ethernet. So therefore, we need to go through that same transition. The second um, finding, and we asked, what is the main reason you are interested in learning about the metaverse? Um, and as you can see, 36% of respondents indicated that the main reason for wanting to learn more about the metaverse was to separate hype from reality, um, with a further 26% wanting to develop a metaverse strategy. So focusing firstly on that first statistic around um, wanting to separate hype from reality. Um, clearly the fact that there is little consensus about what the metaverse actually is, alongside the evolving nature of the metaverse creates a perfect storm for business leaders trying to make sense of the metaverse. So I know we just touched on it, but you know, what, what would you say to those members here today um, to, that, that are perhaps skeptical or hesitant about the metaverse? Um, uh, Sandy, can I start with you? Well, uh, thanks, Gabriel. I think I think in reality we just covered that really, like uh, in the in the last uh, few minutes. That you know the, the 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 skepticism comes from that exactly from the hype, and a lot of contradictions sometimes when you read different articles and everybody's putting a lot of articles about what is metaverse and everybody has different opinions and you don't know yeah. then who to trust better because you know they're all saying that they're experts in that field. So I think I think reality is that you know what we need to focus on is that world is changing. That's a fact. And this is this this is going to become a new reality soon. And I think I think the early days now allows people to probably just uh, I would probably jump in a little bit of a strategy side. So thinking about you know how can you how can you apply uh, your your business case in 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 the metaverse in the future. So just just trying to find the the good use case and without getting too far in investing so much money in, in certain things is just looking at looking and trying, you know, proof of concept, I guess, see, okay, maybe the, this is a web augmented reality solution for my products that I can do the filters with. Maybe there's a little virtual world that we can explore something about our brand, maybe something else. I think, I think, I think, I think to kind of reduce that skepticism in general, people need to start trying different things. I think, I think through trial and error, and I know that, you know, sometimes you think, oh, we shouldn't invest too much money in something that we don't understand. I think important thing is to find a good partner that can help you for that journey and help to identify the, the, the points and 
the business cases for your business where you can actually apply these proof of concepts, see how it works, and then slowly but surely move move forward. So how I kind of trying to explain this from my perspective. Mm, yeah. And, and Misha? Yes, it's great points that he's raised here. So um, I just whilst you were talking, I was thinking maybe one of the uh, one of the challenges we have is we we lack proof points, right? So we have nothing quantified. Um, you know, there's there's no real proof that this technology will be a a game changer for companies, and uh, so we're a bit in the void. But uh, you know, normally it's at strategic level, I always say, you know, there, there are two things you can do: is bottom up and top down. So top down would be to say, you know, let's assume in 2030, this will be you know a real thing, and people use it in companies as well as in in in, in consumer spaces and all that. What do we need to do today to really, you know, be important in that space in the future? And then, you know, then you probably need to really distinguish between B2B and B2C, right? So B2B is one thing, B2C, Sandy mentioned a really interesting point is about, you know, that exposure to consumers. How do you, how do you want to leverage on that new spatial internet, that very immersive internet to really be more exposed to get around that advertisement fatigue, which we all experience. So I think there are really opportunities there and companies should build their strategy around this. But then there's a, the, the bottom up, right? So what do we do tomorrow and the day after? And I think it all boils down to, you know, for, for corporate specifically, increasing productivity. And it's always about being, you know, both effective as well as efficient. And, uh, and maybe in terms of effectiveness, uh, you know, the metaverse may not be the right thing, but in terms of efficiency, I think it is really. And uh, if you have looked at, you know, the ways how maybe companies can structure, particularly B2B companies can structure their sales exercises, you know, how, how do you sell products? In fact, you know, we have done this. I work for a company called, called Eric's now. We sell 5G gear. We have the ability now to do that in a in a very immersive spatial environment, and we know that the human brain has been geared for millions of years to to engage with uh, you know spatial environments much better than with a textbook or with a brochure or something. So I think you know there are huge advantages of doing this from ground up, but we need to be patient. So this will not be a a billion dollar opportunity for any of these companies tomorrow. We need to build it up very slowly until we get to this hockey stick environment where the three things of networks, applications, and devices come together. So uh, be patient, but uh, execute two strategies, I always say, bottom up and top down. Great, that, that, that's a super takeaway already. Um, I, I think actually, um, just drawing on, on our most recent survey, which is a Destructive Trends survey, uh, um, our members are already showing that if you fast forward three years uh, to, to 2026, they think that, that the metaverse will be potentially four times more disruptive than it is right now. So I think that's a viewpoint that, that it's on it's on people's radar. Um, but I guess maybe a, a point on, on the strategy is where do you start? How do you how, how do you make a start? And can you experiment in ways which are perhaps you know slightly deeper at a, a tougher time at the moment? Um, Santi, I don't know if, if is that something that you sort of work with your clients on on, on experimenting before implementing a, a broader metaverse strategy? Yeah, I think I think what I can answer really, you know, in terms of the strategizing it and thinking through the process is how you can get to that point. I think I would say that ensure that, you know, it's just to choose the right partner, obviously, external partner for it, uh, who will help to identify the opportunities within the metaverse solutions for your business. Um, what we do often when I do is a discovery sessions and workshops with clients, uh, bringing the teams together, empowering them with knowledge, uh, you know. Uh, sharing the expertise and knowledge, and then, you know, giving them opportunities to come up with the great business ideas, uh, you know, with, that they can apply for the for the metaverse. So that's really short one. I mean, if we break it down in a couple of bits, I think, again, identify the use cases that will be beneficial for the business uh, and creating proof of concepts and validate the ideas, you know, before in seriously investing in it. And I think that's what Misha, I guess, agreed as well. I think it's a good it's a good starting point. Uh, choosing the right platform, uh, and it's two things for that is, is one, the platform we're talking about the hardware, like Oculus or HTC, for example, uh, HMDs, uh, and then also a platform where the content is created. So it can be something that is, uh, online. It'd be something that your partner can maybe create for you and be standalone experience. 
Uh, and you know, there's a lot of examples. I think we're going to cover that a bit later. But that's just two 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 parts of a platform. Uh, content itself. Uh, think about you know what's the most suitable format. Maybe it's uh, for brands. Maybe like for Nike. Maybe it's a it's a it's a three D um, uh, interactive virtual sneakers that you can customize and do the things like that. Maybe it's a full scale virtual spaces where your your uh, your customers can come in, uh, share your sh share things together, uh, build something. Uh, or play games uh, and so on. Uh, the marketing side of things, how would you market it? Where would you where would you talk about it? How is that going to be positioned across social media? So let's say, uh, and how, you're, how 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 would you tell the story to your customers? You know, why would they come over? What's the benefit? What's going to happen there? And I think last but not least, I would say the feedback and then continuous improvement. Just collect as much feedback as you can, and especially in the early days of it. See, you know, what works, what doesn't. Again, again, it all will come from a proof of concept, I guess. But, you know, when it's live, when it's running, it's good to have two-way communication with your customers, being, you know, leaving them ability to, you know, comment on things or maybe send you some sort of feedback. And maybe that could be done for gamification. I mean, from my experience, we did quite a few, few um, solutions where gamification was part of collecting feedback. But just in a more fun way, in a more interesting way. And, you know, it's, it's, it's really, it really helps. Uh, companies to improve their solutions uh, moving forward, and I, I think I think that would probably be my my view. So um, the third finding, um, and I think the previous discussion again sets the scene nicely. But we asked, what do you see as the main opportunity for entering the metaverse? Um, and as you can see, forty-one percent of respondents report that their main opportunity for entering the metaverse is to build more immersive experiences for consumers. Um, and the second one being to create more connections with customers. Um, and it makes it makes sense that um, as people spend more time online uh, and increasingly in the metaverse um, or, or or in virtual in virtual worlds, brands have to meet consumers there. And once they're in, it's easy to, to imagine why they might find this immersive VR AR space um, sort of so great. Um, but it's not just the gamified graphics and design that pulls co consumers in and keep them there is also due to the level of personalization which allows users to create more customized experiences um so Misha I know you've been exploring um and researching lots of use cases for the metaverse I know we we spoke about it previously um so could you kind of give us a bit of a background as to what what, what do you think are the strongest use cases um to, to achieve what what people see as the opportunity you know, the stats really uh, geek me out. This is amazing. I mean, uh, so there is really a consumer drive here, uh, which I'm a bit surprised about, but it's good to see, to be honest. You know, it's really great to see. You've done fantastic work here, guys. So, um, you know, because the impression we get is that at the beginning, it's really going to be a, a B2B game. So how can we help be, uh, let's say, the, the fourth point, right? Higher productivity level. So how can you... Yeah really improve the bottom line inefficiencies in a company by making things more immersive, you know, using, for instance, Meta's uh, 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 Horizon uh, Workspace app and uh, just become a little bit more effective as, as, as a worker. And uh, to see that appetite to really go for the consumer market is fantastic. We need to do a lot of work there though. So just to make that clear, to make this really happen, you know, three things always need to come together, which is an iconic device okay an iconic uh, application and an iconic network so i argue we do have the iconic network which is 5g and we're now already doing first baby steps towards 6j um but we're still waiting for these iconic devices and by virtue of that for the iconic applications and that's really really important think about that really the iphone has changed the world but it was because the network was in place the device came out in the applications emerge through the app store. And we need a similar dynamics to come over the next years to come. But once we crack that, assuming, let's go with the assumption that, you know, Meta will come out with uh, the Mark Zuckerberg promise, the Quest 3, you know, in March next year. So we do have a device there, then others will come in, you know, that will probably force the, the hand of the likes of, of Apple and other players. Uh, we don't know exactly how these devices will look like, but eventually we will end up with AR. Uh, devices. So, you know, my personal opinion is that it is really AR, which will change the consumer world. It will not be beyond. And therefore, we still need to wait a little bit for these devices. It's a really hard problem to crack also to get high fidelity graphics in there. 
So we still need a bit for that, but as soon that comes out, then we need applications. And um, you know, whilst we do we do have loads of developers who really know about how to develop volumetric content, because you really need, as as um, Fatia said, you know, it's going to be an immersive spatial internet. Uh, we we need completely different uh, developer skills and. Uh, yeah, you know, the tools have been around for a while, but uh, compare that to the billions of developers who do that for the smartphone today, we still need to build that skill. So it will take a while, but I'm I'm super excited to see that companies are really, you know, geared up to to attack the consumer market. And let's let's see if we can make that happen jointly. Hmm? Well, maybe maybe we need to do a do another survey in, in six months' time to see if it's changed and then and then we'll know perhaps that that, that, that could yeah. be a good idea. That's a good one, yeah. That down. Well, yeah. right. um, so I, I wonder if um, we're, we're going to now have a, a, a live poll. Very exciting. Um, so a poll is going to pop up for you um, imminently. Um, whilst we're waiting for that, I, I noticed that um, we've got a question in the um, uh, Q and A box. If yeah. people do have questions throughout the throughout the uh, session, please do stick them in there, and uh, we'll get to it at the end. We set aside about 10, 15 minutes to, to answer those. So um, please do fill, fill that box with, with questions and we'll get around to it. Um, I wonder if we, we need to come back to um, the results of the, of the poll perhaps. Um, oh, here we go. Um, so we've got the results in front of us. Um, what is likely to be your next step into the metaverse? And there's a, there's, a, there's, a, a, there's a winner by the looks of it and that's item, identifying use cases. Um, so hopefully um, the conversation we just had Will help people um, do that, and it sounds like Santi and Misha. There's a couple of takeaways that people have for that. So I don't know if there's any extra reflection you have on that. I think, from my perspective, I think you know I'm happy to see that whole result because I think it's very important. I think sometimes you know, I uh, when we're talking with clients, uh, sometimes you you kind of trying to find the best solution for them, really. And sometimes people just come in and say, "We just need this. We just need to get into the metaverse. We need we need this. We need that. We need to do it." But you know, through the discovery sessions, sometimes when you're sitting with the team, you can see that the solution for them probably would not yet be necessarily connected to the you know to that metaverse. Um, and 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 it's it's just being fair and it's it's trying to really identify the real use case first before before going for it. I think it's very, very important. And it's really good that people thinking in that perspective, that identifying use case is, is a crucial in from my perspective and from my experience, because that will definitely help you to get the best results. And then what we found, what we found is, you know, that because there is such a special dependency um, in, in that metaverse narrative, actually to look rather than use cases to first look at use places right so once you start thinking about use places then suddenly the use cases become much easier then the business case will fall in place so start with use places and and see where where it really takes you so the question we asked was what is your biggest concern about the metaverse um and 22 percent of responders reported that privacy and security are their greatest concerns about the metaverse. Um, and I, I guess with the evolution of the internet, which started out as a bit of a bastion of freedom of expression that turned into a privacy and security minefield, um, leaders will have to balance the user experience with protecting the privacy of individuals and the security of businesses. Um, Misha, I know you do sort of a lot of work with Ofcom and FCC. Um, you know, could you provide a bit of an idea as to what are the privacy and security and perhaps ethical challenges that are presented by the metaverse to perhaps sort of expand on that statistic a bit? Yeah, oh, that's brilliant. I'm, I'm happy to see that. And people, you know, it's, yeah, I think every, every consumer has a right to be worried about these. So, I mean, ethics is the, uh, the overarching kind of bubble and uh, you have privacy, security and other things in it. Um, let me start with ethics, and I think that's really important because we can end up with a with a new construct, uh, you know, where we will be building new social norms, and uh, we, we just don't know how to go about this. The, the big test I always do is, you know, would I be happy to have my kids go into this new construct and be there and feel safe? And uh, so I think, you know, as a society, we need to start teaching what does it mean to be in a in a in a digital spatial environment which is very, very potentially very different from the physical one we're used to. So I think we be dealt with it from a society point of view. Uh, parents have a role to play, um, not only the regulator. 
Now, when it comes to security, I personally think we are pretty okay because we've been doing uh, security from an engineering point of view for a very long time. And of course, there are always hiccups. And, uh, you know, particularly if you assume that some of the metaverse constructs will be based on Web 3.0, um, you know, it is uh, so blockchain type of technology. A lot has happened over the last uh, weeks. So we need to get through that and get that right. Uh, privacy is probably the, one of the bigger issues. And the reason is, is because we have never dealt with privacy from an engineering point of view. It was always an application game. So when you wanted to use a, an application, there were terms and conditions, the famous T's and C's, which you needed to take off. And you really want to use the app, right? Can you imagine living without Google Maps these days? It's unthinkable. Yet you need to tick it off. So I think the big challenge we have to overcome as a, as a tech community is to build privacy mechanisms right into the engineering stack. Do not leave that necessarily to the, uh, to the app developers, to the big corporates or the small companies. Really make sure it's deep in there. What can we do there? And I think, you know, once we start posing that very hard question, we have loads of very smart engineers around the world who can solve that. And I'm very, very positive, but we still need to do a lot. And, and once we have cracked this, once we have the privacy security in place um, and the ethics is taken care of, I think we're on a winning streak. But all three need to work really in tandem here. Otherwise, it will not work out as a, as a social construct. Yeah, and, and just as a follow-up, I know sort of the Metaverse Standards Forum is perhaps sort of the most well-known um, sort of collaboration effort. Are there, are there other sort of standards and regulation that we're likely to see over the next year or two? Well, that's a good question. So we have a few alliances popping up, right? So, and these alliances means these are industry interests and, uh, you know, loads of companies come together. There are two or three important um, industry alliances at the moment uh, related to the metaverse. But uh, you asked the right question. The question is, you know, who's going to define the standards? So the standards are really the ones which bind us essentially to do something. And uh, we call them SDOs, the standards defining organizations. And they need to be recognized by governments around the world. And there are not too many of those. So I'm hoping that the IEEE will take up some of these uh, standards requirements. I know they work a lot in, in Web 3.0, so blockchain, uh, work a lot in security naturally uh, and privacy. Um, we need to build in some of that natively into the mobile stack. And that is typically 3CPP. Uh, Etsy works on that, the ITU. So it really needs to move from industry alliances, which are these early days where we align thinking across a wide brush of companies into true standards, which are recognized by governments and therefore can be enforced by the regulator. Super, thanks for that. And, and, and Santi, to come to you from, from your perspective, obviously when you work with clients, there's a certain level of risk associated with, with a new type of experience. How, how do you sort of communicate that to your, to your clients and help them mitigate it? Well, I guess in, in, in from our perspective, we'll always come, uh, we'll always come with the, uh, with the really question, like what is the end result and how do you want to sort of get to, the, to, 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 the, to their experiences? And if you're talking about the security uh, situation and privacy as well, it's just from my perspective, what I would like to add is metaverse of the future will be a lot of sensors in your home, on your wearables, and a lot of data that will obviously needs to be protected. And I agree with Misha on this one that, you know, this needs to be embedded in a tech stack rather than leaving it for different platforms or different developers to, to decide what, what, to, what which boxes needs to be ticked off or not. So I think it's all, from my side, you know, I just, I kind of didn't introduce myself properly because I'm very involved in the B2B industry. And what I'm working on mainly is, uh, is, is sort of training and learning, employee engagement solutions for, for a blue chip company. So, uh, you know, with this is a, is, a, is a kind of a slightly different world from, let's say, a consumer market. Uh, you know, because we are looking at very sensible and sensitive, inform sorry, sensitive information from our clients that is internal. And some of these solutions cannot be, you know, even put out of the specific building. So it's an immersive metaverse experience in the building, not even on the Internet. Uh, so 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 that those are a different type of challenges that we need to overcome with the protection of of, of sen uh, sensitive organizational data. So I think you know at the moment I think it's I think it's it's been it's been it's been tackled quite well, but the more I think the more of the interconnected applications interconnected tools together will 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 form uh, the future of metaverse. Uh, those challenges will inevitably come 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 across. I think one thing I wanted to say that 
from a privacy and security, I think is going to be a, a new governance created really for 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 the metaverse because it is actually uh, a new world that needs the laws and needs all of these things put together by someone. And we are talking about this decentralization, but I don't quite feel that that is actually completely possible. I think there needs to be a gov gov governance sort of structure there to protect, uh, you know, uh, kids, people, I mean, whoever using that in certain ways. And also I had a, actually, I'm mean, kind of answering a question with a question. Uh, I was reading a couple of articles recently about what happens if you commit a crime in metaverse? Are you going to be punished in real life? Who's going to be punishing you? Which, which country, which government? So, you know, it's quite, a, it's quite a lot of things to think about still. And I'm sure we will overcome that. But, you know, it's, 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 a, it's, a, big, it's a big thing to, 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 to tackle, really. Got one already um, from the chat. And it says, if you focus on humans with new devices and higher networks, are you creating a digital divide where only the richer people and richer societies can participate? I don't know if anyone wants to touch on that. Misha, yeah. can... oh, both, both. Should we start well, with okay. Misha? Uh, yeah, well, actually, you know, it is uh, it's a great question. I really love that question because it is really on the depth of our minds and uh, it's popped up in so many discussions here. Um, and you're absolutely right. If we continue with our journey where devices will cost $3,000 and you need a 5G uh, network to really, or a 6G network in the future to make that happen, things will not get better, they will get worse. Uh, we, we agree with you on that. So what we are trying very hard to understand is, you know, how can we find the a common denominator with technologies which are more backward compatible? So at the end of the day, you need some form of tech to really make things happen. Um, so we need also the scale to kick in for cheaper devices to come out. Remember the very first smartphones were really not affordable anywhere in the world. And it's just really become, as the business models kicked in, they became subsidies of operators and then, you know, um, other, go other government structures could kick in. And then suddenly that became a proposition which the majority of the world could use, but we still have more than a billion people unconnected. So we still have that homework to do. Uh, but we're paying attention to that minimum data set or minimum capability to make sure that as many people as possible will be able to use by the end of this decade that that what I think is a fascinating technology. Great question, Alan. Thank you. And Santi, I wonder if you've got something to add. Yeah, I think I think again, great question. I think you know, uh, you know, at least from the way we approach things, working with uh, with uh, with the larger organizations that have different. Uh, presence in different parts of the world with different capabilities of internet and devices and things like that. Uh, I agree with Misha, you know, we're working hard to find the best uh, sort of, uh, I would say a compromise with the tech and, uh, and the output, like what type of graphics we are going to look at at the moment. If we come back with a few years back in terms of the devices can still support those experiences. And you no, know, we, we did quite a lot of work with that because important is that, you know, everybody has a good experience because if, if this is not a good experience there's no point of making it because it's going to put people off immediately if it doesn't load fast enough it doesn't open sometimes you need to compromise on things sometimes maybe it's not all singing or dancing but it does work and it's still engaging it's still interesting to explore so i think i think i'm sure that a lot of companies are looking at this and i, I think you know it's it's a little bit of a false sort of uh you know situation here when we're getting these uh, new devices from these big companies i'm not going to name them but uh you know that cost 1500 dollars uh, and more uh, of course it's not going to be affordable for all the people but i think it's going to change with the technology itself or the hardware becoming cheaper as well we have we have a lot of change happening now i personally a bit surprised with some of the cost of the devices when i'm looking from 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 where we are now with all of the technology I think maybe partially this could be um, could be a reason because of the supply chain issues and disruption because of the COVID and things like that. I'm sure that in the next few years we will see more players out there uh, that will offer a much more affordable devices that will have amazing functionality and you know and it's going to be available for a wider audience. That's I think is a crucial thing and it, I think is going to happen. I've also I've got a follow up for for Misha perhaps. Um, you spoke about five G and potentially. 60 what role does that play in the metaverse i wonder if you could sort of provide some some um background some context for that 
Yeah, I mean, if one, one, you know, we maintain that the, the majority of the thrust or the, the really interesting propositions will be in the consumer market at the end of this decade, and there will really be AR most likely, and when you will be outdoors. So indoors, I think people can use, you know, Wi-Fi and VR, and it's all great. There are propositions there, uh, but uh, it will most likely remain a, a need. So that's what, what we see. So. Once you go outdoors, you of course need a real-time connectivity for obvious reasons. You want to load data, maybe you want a more spatial interactive map and all that. But then we, we discovered something really interesting doing experiments here in, in, in our labs here in Silicon Valley. It's, you know, when you have a, a 4K, so I have a 4K smartphone here um, and, uh, you know, the experience is fantastic. It's really great. You know, the resolution on the screen is really great. Now, you know, when you, when you buy the Quest um, Pro, and I believe the Quest 3, which will be consumer device, will, will, be, will have similar specs. It also has 4K, uh, 2K and 2K. So you have 2Ks per eye here. And um, the experience, you know, from a resolution point of view is not at the same level as a 4K experience on, <clears throat> on your smartphone, which really showed us that we need to go, you know, in the, in the headset, uh, you know, head-mounted devices, you really need a much higher resolution to get the same wow experience. The last thing you want is, is people to have a great experience here and a just about okay experience here. So this needs to be great and that needs to be great. Actually, this needs to be awesome. So to get something like 8K uh, resolution, 12K, 24K in the future in there, you know, we, we have loads of issues there. And one of the biggest problems is to how do you render the content onto these glasses in real time, right? So let's assume Pokemon Go. So everybody knows Pokemon Go, but of course, by the end of the decade, it will be something else. How do you render a really great uh, uh, three-dimensional Pokemon Go, which understands spatial context? So it understands, you know, there's a table here, and it would therefore not just be projected to my glasses, but actually come behind the uh, table, come onto the table, right? So uh, how do you do that in real time? And it turns out doing this on the glasses is just not, is not possible. Doing that on the device where you may tether it to might be okay, but you know you will run out of battery uh, almost immediately. So the only thing, the only way to do that properly is to off offload that to the internet, to the cloud, to a nearby cloud, because it turns out we also have to do that at very very low latency, right? And the reason is, as I move my head, I don't want the uh, the Pokemon Go to fall off the table or do something. It has to be spatially anchored, even if I move my head. So therefore, you know, we need to send my head position in almost real time to an edge cloud server, which renders that Pokemon Go at high fidelity at 8K, 12K, what it is, streams it back down to me on the glasses in real time. And, and I think it's happening all here, but in reality, it happens on the edge cloud. So we therefore need a so we need a dense, you know, kind of cloud, edge cloud ecosystem. And we need that 5G uh, connectivity to really connect these glasses in real time. And uh, we see already, you know, 5G, can do the very first baby steps, but we'll need 5G advanced, which will come, you know, mid this decade and then 6G really in the early days and end of this decade. So I hope I answered your question here, why we truly need the network, you know, in, in that whole equation uh, long term. Yeah, no, yeah. I think that that, that, that that makes sense and I'm sure it provides some clarity. Um, I'm, I'm going to go with, a, with another question for, for Santi. Um, and I think you guys were just talking about it around cost. Um, of headsets, but also in terms of cost for organizations wanting to develop a B2B experience or whatever, there, there are different levels um, of an immersive experience that you can create. Isn't that right, Santi? There's, there's, you can turn it up, you can turn the dial up, and you can turn the dial down. Could you explain that a little bit? I think, yeah, I would probably say that, you know, we are moving towards the situation where there's a lot of platforms that allow you to build things now, because, you know, I, I remember 2015 when we just started to explore VR and all of those solutions where you had to go to a specific software, build it as a one-off experience, and then, you know, it will be very expensive to build and then very expensive to maintain. But those 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 years are are, are over now, and I think I'm, it's, I'm really excited to see a lot of different platforms coming out which is basically offering your SaaS solutions on online where you can actually build fairly impressive experiences right now without having to hire an army of developers and, 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 and other, other people. So, I mean, I think what I would say is probably how bespoke your solution needs to be. Because again, you know, there is example of BMW working with NVIDIA Omniverse uh, and building, you know, a, a factory, virtual factory planning tool together. Uh, you know, it's a very complex thing. It involves AI and 
a lot of different platforms connecting together in there and stuff like that. With these experiences, these are these are kind of one of a kind, as I call them. So obviously, these type of things is is still is still remains fairly expensive because they are complex. But then they're solving a very complex problem as well, which then worth investing. So again, I would probably say that depends on what kind of you want to achieve. If you are if if the solution and again coming back comes back to proof of concept and all of these things, mm -hmm. if solution solves a problem. That otherwise will cost you 200 million but it costs you 2 million to make i mean that's really kind of a no-brainer you go for it and you do it and then you save a lot of money and then every, everything is amazing if it's more of uh if it's if it's something very scaled back from that complexity and you just want to want to have a, a storytelling about your product or storytelling about your business or service which maybe involves people to come into a virtual world exploring your brand exploring your products and doing uh some interesting things for the web xr let's say you know trying uh, trying uh, sneakers on you know virtually trying the sneakers you know putting putting some avatars together and things like that there are platforms now that allows you to build that so i think again it's all going to be back you know the cost is going to be come from your uh, uh proof of concept really and thinking you know from your partners that help you to put things together and and think about how will you make something to happen do you need nvidia omniverse solution or maybe you want to go on the on the some of the online SaaS platforms and build a very meaningful experience that will actually give you a lot from that without investing you know big sums of money so it really understanding your needs uh is 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 a key kind of a thing and that's that that would basically predict the cost of what exactly which way you want to go Great, thanks so much, Santi. I, I think we've now got a question um, in the Q and A, but I'm I, I'm going to have to blur out a, a certain word. So, um, Pete says PC Gamer created a massive campaign to push Goblin Mode as the Oxford English Dictionary Word of the Year, um, as they massively opposed the word Metaverse purely because, in their words, the Metaverse is bleep because it already exists and it's called the Internet. I think that links back to our our, our first question, but um, Misha, is, is is that a view that you share, or um, you know, maybe as a as a parting thought um, to answer that question? Yeah, you know, I, I as I said, you know, I really think a lot of new tech innovations will come together to form this new internet, right? So, Santi, um, right, you said it will be a very special internet. Therefore, by virtue of construct, it will be much more immersive. We need to give it a name, right? So we need to call it something. You know, you can call it just the internet. That's fine, you know, or you can call it Internet Two Zero, um, and that probably is good too. But at the end of the world, at the end of the day, you know, we need to <clears throat> recognize reality. And there, there are some CEOs, CIOs, CFOs out there. You know, if you come to them and say, "Look, I need uh, hundred million dollars to do um, an internet," they will not move. Because they will say, well, we have it already. So we I think we need a new terminology. Truly, I believe that. It's it's a it's a you know, it's that marketing angle which we truly needed these early days for the believers really to jump on. And um, you know, you may not like metaverse because you know it wasn't really coined by Mark Zuckerberg, right? So is uh, Neil Stevenson really in his uh, novel Snow Crash, who came up with that. But uh, it is we need that new terminology and we think you know we'll stick with that for the time being and i have to say you know almost all silicon valley player uh with the exception if i if i understand well apple of course uh you know everybody else will stick with uh with the metaverse even microsoft anybody else so we, we need that terminology and that's an easy word it it you know we have we've had huge investment and we can chuck in a lot of other technologies into this that's i think the great advantage so at the beginning it was all vr now it's also AR. Now it's also 5G low latency edge cloud connectivity. Uh, in the next months to come, it will be including AI. There have been, you know, we haven't talked about this at all, actually. You know, AI has gone, has gone through quantum leaps in the last weeks, every day, every hour, something new phenomenal comes up. And uh, you know, you chuck this into the capability. And I think, you know, the internet is transforming now very quickly. And I'm I'm very excited, um, you know, to be honest. And for me, you know, the, the, this new terminology makes it much easier to convey things. Therefore, I'm I'm up for this. I think we should stick to one term, agree to this, and just run with it. Yeah, that's my view. Cool, Santi. I wonder if I can come to you for a final thought. Well, I mean, 
I think I think I completely agree with Misha. I mean, terminology there needs to be a terminology for for these new things. And I think you know what we what we're lacking of metaverse. The word metaverse is, is nothing wrong with that. I think the way it's explained, and it's gonna take time for 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 all of different companies, different organizations to come together with some sort of like a you know like a one uh, approach and one explanation of what that is eventually. And I think that will solve this problem because yes, in I absolutely this is a spatial internet. I mean, that's true. It's already, I mean, the internet already exists. It's just a new, uh, new generation internet, I would say. You know, it's it's evolvement of internet. So yeah, I mean, people can call it whatever they want. I mean, I think, but as I said, I agree with Misha, you need to have a terminology. It's easy to come in and say, okay, we're working on a metaverse project, we're working with a metaverse product. We're doing a metaverse experience, right? So that's I think it's absolutely fine to call it as it is. I think it's I think it's I think nothing nothing wrong with that. Great. Well what a great few takeaways there. And I think it's only positive. So um and that's good. I, um, I, without further ado, I'm going to hand back to Emma, but I'd just like to say personally, thanks to everyone who, who joined us uh, as an attendee and thanks to Misha and, and Santi for joining the panelists. But Emma, I'll hand back to you now. Thank you, Gabriel, very much indeed. We've covered so many topics today. So everything from the opportunities available across industries and B2B and B2C organisations of any size, the complexity of the transition to the metaverse, the importance of developing bottom up and top down strategies, how to leverage the spatial internet and also take your customers on your journey, as well as the importance of just starting to experiment by validating ideas with the right partners and starting with use places even before use cases, as well as the requirement for new skills to build iconic devices, iconic applications, and also iconic networks, all the way through to how to positively empower individuals through technology while looking at data ownership, associated privacy and ethical standards and challenges, and creating added value for your community of customers and your business at the same time. And as we move into a decentralized world, we must look at the safe, responsible development for everyone. So a very big thank you, echoing what Gabriel's already said to Misha and Santi for an excellent session, looking at some really important issues and some incredible insights and viewpoints from both of you this afternoon. So thank you. And to all the members who have tuned in today and for your questions and your comments and to Gabriel and everyone at Chief Disruptor for all your hard work and commitment in bringing our first Metaverse report and second webinar on the topic to life. Mm -hmm.